So uh, I'm Ryan Gardner. Uh, I'm an aquatic toxicology research technician uh, here in the aquatic toxicology lab uh, for Colorado Parks and Wildlife up in Fort Collins. Uh, I just graduated from CSU with my zoology degree. Uh, and I'm about to start my master's program for education sciences uh, to become a high school science teacher. Hi, my name is Gage Dean. I'm a senior at Colorado State University studying fish, wildlife, and conservation biology. And I'm also a technician here in the aquatic toxicology lab. Um, and I will let Casey introduce herself here. My name is Casey. I'm also a senior at CSU uh, studying fish, wildlife, and conservation biology. I plan to go get my master's degree in environmental science as of now, uh, starting fall in 2021. And uh, I am also a aquatic toxicology technician as well. And I'm Pete. I direct the lab and I work with Megan almost every day here. Uh, she, she's always running samples upstairs and I'm always making them down here. <laughs> so first of all, we want to thank you all for sampling the water chemistry of surface waters here in the great state of Colorado. One question that many people have, even some river watch scientists, is what is this data used for? What are we collecting this data for? The truth is, our data, our, our lab has a symbiotic relationship with river watch. The river watch data is used primarily to determine what surface waters are impaired or healthy by comparing each site to other locations across the state. We also use this data to monitor trends and changes in the water quality. And lastly, this data is used to compare sites to national and state water quality standards. That is what we do in this lab, is to conduct experiments to derive standards. For example, our experience, experiments may tell us that a certain concentration of copper is lethal to mayflies. If any of the samples of that river watch analyzes has a concentration of copper that is higher than our value, we can predict that mayflies in that water system are in danger as well. Not always, but often, for us to claim that a surface water is healthy or unhealthy, we need a threshold or a value of which a stream is at risk. Here in this lab, we do just that. And then the question that arises from that, right, is that how do we find these exact thresholds? Uh, and, uh, right, and that was kind of the question that we uh, posed earlier this week, as well as uh, at the start of this meeting, right, is that if you had to start from absolute scratch, right, how would you derive a safe level of pollution for every possible chemical in our surface waters? Uh, we're super happy with the responses we got. Uh, Del Norte High School, thank you. Uh, you made some really good points, uh, including re uh, mentioning that we should be paying attention to the proximity to mines uh, of our bodies of water, uh, because mines, as a lot of people know, can be a huge source of pollution in our waters. Uh, and an additional thing to that, right, is that we would have to prove both that the pollution was coming directly from the mine and also the pollution was causing an effect in the fish that we care about, right? Like lethality. Um, and then some other responses that we got also include, uh, some people said, right, that you could observe these organisms in nature, right? See so like, oh, there's less algae in this area that has more toxicants, or there's, you know, fish are more likely to die in this water with copper, et cetera. Um, and that is a great point. The problem that comes with that kind of environmental observation as an approach is that you can't show causation uh, that strongly, uh, as well as the, right, there's lots of different stressors that could be in there, right? You can't control for all your variables. Uh, the other approach that we've got, uh, some people were responding with, would be to the uh, stereotypical, right, create a bunch of little like beakers of different toxicants and throw some fish in there, keep adding more until we see them croak. And that's, you know, a sign that that should be our concentration threshold. Uh, both of these, uh, approaches are imperfect, right? But it's kind of finding the balance between them where we can find this nice middle ground of, of control while also having environmental realism. Uh, so, and uh, now uh, Pete will uh, talk about that. Right, so the, uh, since the nation started caring about uh, water quality standards back in the late 70s, there's been this debate do we, do we focus more on the ecology side of things in the field studies, or do we focus more on laboratory studies, these simplistic things? 
um, does that add up to the realism of nature? So I really appreciated all the responses we got from school groups, and I'm hoping we get more in the future because I collect answers to that exact question. So even in the years to come, please send them my way. Um, so uh, what I'd kind of like to do is quiz those high school students. If you're in the water quality profession, you can't answer. But if you're a student, please use the chat there and tell me what you think are the advantages or disadvantages of a field versus a lab study. And Megan's going to summarize those at the end if we don't have any questions. So Megan saw us starting to tear down this experiment. And she's like, well, I think you should really show it off a little bit. So um, before, what we're going to do here is we're going to present uh, what a typical tox test looks like, or perhaps an atypical tox test looks like. And most of that, the backbone of water quality standards, unfortunately, well, not fortunately or unfortunately, but the backbone of those standards do come from traditional tox tests, which is what we do in the lab here. So uh, Ryan has done a wonderful job putting together a video for you today, and he's going to share that. And then Casey's going to describe a recent experiment that we think will influence water quality policy in the future. Yeah, so an important part of uh, setting up these kind of experiments is creating that gradient of toxins that I talked about. Uh, and there's a lot of different ways that we can do that. So we're going to go over a few of the diluters uh, that let us do so. No sound. Thank you for the heads up. <laughs> oh, yep. found it. Yeah, we got it. Thank you. <laughs> All right. So this is a serial diluter inspired by Benoit's 1982 model. Uh, up here, we're going to have our clean water entering the system. Uh, and that's going to be coming down in equal amounts down into the next layer, which is where the toxicant is introduced. So right here, we have our pee pump, which is going to be introducing our toxicant, or in this case, our purple dye, right? Uh, and as it comes up, it's going to be entering uh, this chamber first, which is going to be our high concentration. Uh, this is called a serial diluter because this is, uh, the dilution is going to work in serial. So uh, if this, for instance, we're getting 100% of our dose, right, the next uh, dosage would be at 50% of it. Uh, and then at 25% of the initial one, uh, and then at 12.5% of the initial one, right? So it's, you're taking half of each previous uh, concentration is what will end up in the next concentration. Uh, and then we can follow the water as it goes down into all these different colored. You can see the concentration really line up well there. Uh, and then it will go into these different tubes, which can then uh, go to our actual place where we want the concentration ending up, uh, where we can measure our gradient. Now, what you just witnessed was 14 auto siphons on the Mountain Brung's serial diluter. Now, this was the workhorse of aquatic toxicology in the 70s and 80s. Prior to this, there really wasn't a way to create flow through exposures. Everything was done static renewal, and there's some huge limitations to static renewal. This is more uh, similar to what a fish or an aquatic insect might feel in a, in a river, this constant replenishing of toxicant. Now, it's a rather complex system. You'll notice that we have numerous auto siphons at different depths to dilute or prescribe the correct amount of makeup water. And we have different auto siphons at different depths here of the toxicant. 
Now, this is entirely controlled by the flow of water. There's no electronic metering, although it can be added. It, it does make it a little bit more reliable and waste less water. But the entire system is simply timed and powered by the flow of water uh, at your tap. Now, the toxicant is delivered by a P-pump, but there were older systems to deliver that toxicant, even some that, that were devised in the Roman era. Um, so this, this entire almost Rube Goldberg-like diluter has no moving parts whatsoever. In this one-of-a-kind diluter system for our annular preference chamber, we're going to have our flow of water being split equally up in these two head tanks. Our rightmost head tank will be receiving uh, our toxicant, or in this case, our purple dye. Uh, and our leftmost head tank will just be receiving clear water. Uh, from there, the clear water will travel down from this tank into our top rain system. The top rain system will just be all clear water all the way around. Uh, however, the clear water will be exiting at in equal amounts uh, into these little funnels which lead into the bottom rain system. The bottom rain system will then also be receiving water uh, right here uh, from the toxicant stream, or again, the purple dye. Uh, and this, so this will be where it's going to be most concentrated, but as we move around the circle, we'll slowly get less and less concentrated, creating a really smooth gradient, which looks very nice, as we can see. Alrighty, and now we're gonna hear from uh, Casey. Uh, yes. <laughs> All right, so for our specific example, we are going to talk about an experiment that we just recently did. Um, so we did an experiment looking at how contaminants, in our specific case, the contaminant was zinc, affected aquatic inverts. So we used this specific species of Tani torsini. And so what we did is took these organisms and separated them into six uh, treatment groups. So we had control where zinc was not added at all. And then we had low, mid-low, mid, mid-high, mid and high. And we looked for, we waited for seven months and looked to see how the zinc had affected the population. Once we waited that seven months, we emptied all these lovely tanks, uh, put them into a container, uh, and we went and tested the water quality to make sure that it was at the quality and the zinc levels were at what we expected. Um, and then we counted the aquatic insects or the tani tarsini to see how they were affected. Um, in the end, we had really shocking results. We got an LC20 of about 11 micrograms per liter. So that just kind of shows that a little amount of zinc can cause a big difference. Casey, what's an LC? So I was hoping to see Barb Horn's face when she said 11. Um, so right now, uh, up in Leadville, for instance, in the Arkansas River, uh, we have a site-specific standard of 185 at this hardness. Uh, statewide, it's 48 micrograms per liter, and we had an EC20 of 11. Okay, so now the question was, can you do a quick presentation on how to derive a water quality standard? No, it would be an eight day workshop of lectures and you would all fall asleep. But what I will say is that uh, society has decided if we protect 95% of organisms, those ecosystems will still function. You can agree with that or disagree with that. But back in the 70s and the early 80s, that's what we decided. Um, so what, the, what drives those water quality standards are the lowest four species, or the lowest 5% of species. Uh, in this case, uh, Taney Tarsini was thrown out of consideration for the site-specific standard in Leadville. And when we're talking standards, just so you know, the, we're talking surface water aquatic life standards, we're not talking drinking water standards, which I know a lot of people cite. Um, so in that situation, they kicked out Taney Tarsini and we spent many years finding it and we got it and we cultured it. 
and we found it to be extremely sensitive organism. So that 11 micrograms per liter uh, is way below the state standard and it might drive a new standard. We didn't believe it. We knew people were gonna pose it. So we actually ran that experiment again it was a six month study and indeed the LC50 was again, sorry, the EC20 or the LC20 was again 11 micrograms per liter. Now those, are, what's an LC20? That's the lethal concentration that killed 20% of the organisms. So behind us, what we see is very, very large 500 gallon tanks because every time we tried to do this in small tanks, they died. We had to scale up more towards nature. So uh, if we were working with fish, we'd be using aquaria or we'd be using small lakes. If we're working with insects, first baby instars, we might be using those little bubbly, crazy uh, purple things you saw in the video. That's, a, that's how we expose very, very small organisms. Um, so, you know, I, my PhD is in ecology. I didn't think I was gonna be living in a lab most of the time, but I have to work in a lab. And so now there's some school groups, uh, there's at least two of them. I'm curious as to if in the chat, Megan, we had any comments about what are advantages or disadvantages of basing a standard on field versus lab? Nothing in the chat yet, Pete, but if anybody wants to unmute and students in particular, advantages of field versus lab study or disadvantages, we would love to hear from you. Hey, I'm sorry, we didn't catch the prompt earlier. So I'm gonna give my students just a moment to like think it about it now because we just didn't hear it quite clearly the first time you asked. So that's why okay, we- Okay, cool. Um, yeah, and, and think, think what would be on the test in your of, of scientific methods, right? Like, uh, I mean, you can give your personal opinions too, but what are the scientific advantages of a field-based study versus a lab-based study? So, um, do you guys have any Could I give an uh, answer? Uh, no, you're too old. All right. No, I wanna, I'm just kidding. I do wanna hear your, your idea. I was just gonna say- some high school students and middle school students. I was going to say maybe in a lab, an advantage to do it in a lab would be repeatable results. Very you good. You can kind of be consistent with what you're experimenting on. Whereas I think that in the field, a great example. there's variables. And there's, there's numerous types of replication. You know, one can be temporal replication, right? Like we didn't believe that we actually killed those bugs at 11 micrograms per liter <laughs> zinc, right? So we reproduced the entire study and we got the exact same result. Another form of replication is when you're doing stats and uh, you, need, you need to have a certain number of replicates within the experiment. So yeah, replication is a really good one. We got anyone under the age of 19. Birth at high school, we would love to hear from you. We'll put you on, on the spot. Keith is gonna answer a question. He's, they're just being shy. It, in a lab condition, you wouldn't have as many outside influences as you would get in uh, natural situations as well. Hello. <laughs> Hi. Good afternoon, Bradley. <laughs> <laughs> no, we're, we're unmuted, guys. So, uh, hi, everybody. We're just, we're having, we're having a hard time actually participating because we're all just using my computer and I am the sub and so um, this is an interesting Zoom meeting, but they're probably going to have to rewatch it on, on your YouTube because, you know, <laughs> technology. But thank you for including us. And, and we'll do, we're, we're trying to keep up and pay attention. But, yeah, you it's know. much appreciated. But I think we could, uh, in the future, all the students could go on their personal Chromebooks and rewatch it on the YouTube channel. No problem. We appreciate the effort, you guys. Yeah. Well, we appreciate you guys. Okay. okay. Well, I look. Yeah. Thanks. Yeah. Thanks, Maggie. Thank I you. look forward to more answers being emailed to us in the future. Then, thank you. Nikki, did you get cut off? Uh, oh no, that is uh, all that we had uh, for y'all in terms of our presentation. Uh, and thank you to uh, I think we got yeah from uh, Nikki's classroom. Thank you for y'all's input. Uh, both 
uh, beforehand and during this. Uh, as well as thank you all for uh, watching us talk about the stuff we're passionate about. It was great. <laughs> are you going to open up the floor for questions? Because I have a question. I was about to say, yeah. Do you have? Uh, are there any questions? What would? How would you guys answer that question? Uh, as far as advantages for lab work versus in the field. I think we got to open it up above 19 acceptable to answer. Real, thanks for throwing it in there. Chris Madsen, he's going to give it to his students in a testing week and he'll have them email us. Perfect. And then Nikki, I'm sorry. One of your students answers, what's your name? Oh, my name's Keith. Keith? Awesome. And so you said there are fewer outside variable conditions, right? Yeah. And then I think you got cut off. Do you want to expand on that a little bit? Like, could you give an example? Yeah, of an I, was, I was just trying to think of an example, actually. Uh, oil spill. An oil spill, thank you, <laughs> Allison. Uh, <laughs> they're really shy, and I don't know why. They're really smart children right here in front of you, but they're being shy. So, uh, an outside condition could be, because in a lab, you wouldn't exactly have the pollution and the fluctuations and weather conditions that could cause different oxygen amounts in the water itself. Whereas if you were to test in the field, you would see those variations uh, relatively consistently. I'm interested to know if you actually see a huge discrepancy from in your lab and your field testing. Like, oh, it yeah. <laughs> yeah, you do. Yeah, you like, really how, do. How, um, how massive is that? Is uh, like then does that discredit what your lab has found then if it's that big of a discrepancy? We have really, really bad internet connection, so I didn't hear that. I heard is there big discrepancies and then I missed it. Can you say it again? I just said how do you I well I might have to rephrase it now because I don't remember what exactly I said, but since you have these huge discrepancies, does that then change the validity or how do you how do you justify the validity of your lab experiments if that's not consistent with the field experiments, I guess, your field tests? Yeah. Uh, again, the, the government's um, internet connection is pretty bad. But I think I caught what you were saying. I also saw some good comments in there. And indeed, there are discrepancies. And some of them can be attributed to one of the things mentioned here, which is that in nature of phenological cycles, right? You got big pulses in the spring, but not in the fall. Or you have stochasticity that you can't control in nature, but you can in the lab. Also, there's multiple stressors in nature. And in the lab, you can control those stressors, but you might not give the organism the, the, the aquatic life support it needs. So it is a dilemma. And um, that's, those all definitely contribute to that discrepancy, uh, which is why we really need water quality standards to be based off of field observations and be based off of laboratory studies. Laboratory studies, they're experiments, they show causation. In ecology, you have a hard time showing causation if it's just field experiments. But I think on top of that, you also just need biomonitoring. You need physical chemistry monitoring because you know the, often in our history, we've thought insects are tolerant. Oh my gosh, you can't kill them with metals. Uh, but then in the field, they're all gone. So, so to be able to say, uh, indeed, we have an impaired water, even though it's, me, it's totally compliant, that's a good backup plan in case the scientists are wrong. And they often are if they, they have this narrow focus on just the laboratory. So yeah, there is a huge discrepancy. And maybe we can turn that into a whole talk or discussion, or maybe even a work, weekend workshop in and of itself, yeah. Another one that just popped up in the, the lab that maybe Ryan, you want to talk about is synergistic effects that happen in reality, but that aren't accounted for in the lab. I think that's a really big one. You know, the one that Casey was describing, your zinc only experiment. I think that's a really big one that 
you know, right. we only test for 13 metals, right, in the River Watch program. That doesn't mean those don't interact or have uh, synergistic negative impacts or potentially, uh, in few cases, positive impacts. Yeah, absolutely. There are uh, a few just off the top of my head, uh, but uh, right, there are synergistic things, right, that right, reality is going to have that labs won't, right? So for instance, or that, right, we have to make sure that we're keeping in track of in the lab. Uh, one of those things is going to be hardness, right? So the hardness of your water uh, is going to really impact the amount of toxins that you can add in there. The harder the water, the less sensitive the organisms are, generally speaking. Um, another thing that could be doing it, right, is that if you have some sort of toxicant that affects like the respiration of an organism, uh, if that water has a higher amount of dissolved oxygen, it won't affect them at such a heavy rate, right? Like, oh, it's harder for them to breathe, but maybe in this specific river, they there's so much oxygen that it does not make as much of an uh, effect, whereas in a oxygen poor uh, environment, which is again, things that right in the lab, we have to make sure not only is our con uh, concentration of our toxicant, the, uh, what we want it to be in the, each of the different tanks, but that the things like our hardness and that like our, uh, uh, dissolved oxygen and like our conductivity, that those are constant across all of those so that we can try to uh, keep in mind those synergistic effects. Um, but yeah, that's, uh, that is an awesome point, uh, Barb, about uh, the advantages of environmental realism and, and right doing our, our research, not just in the lab, but actually out there, um, because we can only do so much to perfectly recreate that environment. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to add to that. Um, you know, the way we derive water quality standards in North America, it, we were one of the first. So I'm not complaining about our forefathers creating this, uh, but forefathers, not like, not like George Washington, but like Mons and Brungs um, back in the 70s. Uh, the way we regulate, it not only ignores synergism, but it assumes there's no additive response. So you can be near that threshold, near that standard for every single metal every single organic toxicant, oh, and this is still compliant, this river should be fine, right? But in your head, you know, oh, that, that can't biologically be true. And that's why I call policymaking the policy sausage maker. There's a lot of moving parts and they don't necessarily make sense. Um, so again, one more good reason to have something like Riverwatch is going out and monitoring trends and doing biomonitoring to say, hey, everything's dead. I don't care if it's compliant, everything's dead. You gotta do something. So, um, so yeah, good point. It ignores synergism. It, it loves to pay attention to antagonism of toxicants and it, it assumes also no additive response. So that was a really good one. Yeah, 